issues for decision up to a, a, a up to the apex, and uh, that's true in the field. It's it's true back in Washington. So. Um, the architecture or the process, if you will, that we try to use to, you know, galvanize or energize smart power uh, is really a challenge because everyone has different elements of the power in their pocket that they're bringing to the table. Um, the UN is, is one that is a source of um, power and legitimacy that uh, certainly this administration will be paying uh, close attention to. I would also have to point out that within this area it is an overstretched institution. If you look how many peacekeepers to include civilian police are deployed around the world, it is it is very significant and in, in many cases it's uh, as the foreign policy magazine recently uh, labeled soldiers of misfortune because their mandates are, are so hopelessly uh, um, in excess of what they can deliver. So. Uh, part of the success effort uh, uh, in the UN, I hope, will be to, to, to relook how it does business and, and concentrate on areas where it, it can deliver success. Just a personal thought. Elizabeth? Thank you, gentlemen. I'll, I'll just say um, one word, and that is I think while the, the, our, our allies in this discussion have struggled like we have with the architecture, I think, by and large, they, like we, are also now focused more on the philosophical orientation. Okay, we're, we're still struggling in our various roles and responsibilities, and that will continue to evolve depending on the situation. But now I think the focus is going to be more on to what ends. What are we attempting to do, and what is the process by which we uh, um, support the change we're seeking to uh, um, support? Thanks. Thank you. Um, there's a question there, but I, I want to put um, some one quick question to the panel, and that is based on your comments. Um, we are going to have a quadrennial defense review taking place, or is in the process of starting right now, and it's going to address precisely some of the issues that you've discussed about whole of government approaches, how we deal with civil military relations, how we deal with capacities. So I'd like you to think about that uh, and perhaps respond and also take a question that is out in the far. Uh, corners of the room, and then we can have you respond to both of those issues. Thank you. Hi, Sean Callahan with Catholic Relief Services. Um, I appreciate the comments that you, you've all made. I, I said, first of all, though, I think in conflict situations, there's no question that we have to do development. Uh, any of you who have worked in Afghanistan, Pakistan, now Sri Lanka, education for girls, health care for people, uh, farming for the small agriculturalists. We have to be doing those type of initiatives. My concern is what was raised here is capacity building. Uh, you can't just hand it over and we all agree that we have to build that local capacity. But currently our mechanisms really um, force us to choose between the urgent and the strategic, the longer term investments. To me, the big question is what mechanism is the administration going to put in place that allows long-term development that's sustainable, that's needed, as opposed to having us move from one area or another to the country, to one population, to another. What we really need is long-term sustainable development if we're going to have a realistic chance to succeed. I see Elizabeth nodding her head, and I think she should start the uh, responses. Uh, thanks, Sean. Um, you know, when I said earlier, I, I was positing a question, should we be doing, we, the global we, development in the, in the midst of conflict? I wasn't suggesting we shouldn't be. It's a question each organization, each institution has to ask for itself. Institutions have chosen, and I'm glad to hear that. But when I get the question about security, I only pose it back to you. It, it's up to the institutions to decide. Now, specifically on Afghanistan, now that's a great example because, as Larry mentioned, I was there in the early days. And in the case of the health sector, we had to do exactly what you challenged us to think about, and that is how did we ensure the continual delivery of critical health care services in the midst of wanting to build capacity for the Afghans to do it themselves? And so I think as many of you who know Afghanistan know, we, uh, the, the, the donor community, this was not just USAID, but we worked very closely with our colleagues in the U EU, uh, with UNICEF, and with the World Bank to develop a program for the Afghans in which at the same time as we were building their capacity to um, develop 
a health care structure, we were still funding the NGOs and the UNICEF to provide those critical health care services without which many Afghans would have, um, would have died. And so it was about balancing the need to do both. And if people know Afghanistan, I think they know that, that model has been proven to be one of the more successful models in which we continued to build on the delivery of health care services while projecting out a very real capacity of the Afghans themselves to deliver a, a sound health care policy and over time build their capacity to work in conjunction with the NGOs. I would ask ourselves whether or not we should be building parallel so, social service structures at the same time as we're trying to build capacity in many of these countries. We've heard countries say you're developing parallel systems. Yes, we may have to because we want to ensure the delivery of services, but at the same time I go back to my point. At the end of the day, it is their country. They're going to have to develop the capacity to do it themselves. Yes, Larry? Um, you asked about institutions or, or mechanisms, and I can't speak for the administration, but one that's gotten a lot of discussion is a quadrennial development review. The notion of perhaps 180 degrees out of phase with the acute defense review, there would be another review looking at the, the higher overarching sort of strategic level development questions and how we go about it. But two things that we, I think, are already in play in a sense is managing expectations. And, and, and by that I mean weaning people from the notion that we will get immediate satisfactory results from, from assistance and, and creating a, an understanding that it, it takes longer. And then another one that's beginning to be seen, I think, is the incentivization of development. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every one of the short-term strategic, uh, I'm sorry, the short-term stabilization projects that SCRS or the USAID in a transitional setting puts in place was required to have a clause that, that, that forced our implementing partner or incentivized our innovating partner to do strategic development at the same time. That's there are a number of contracts and a number of mechanisms that are already written that way. Um, so I think there are mechanisms already there. They're just coming into fruition. And then th there may be some other policy level mechanisms that will come to be in the next few months. Thank you. Um, there's a gentleman over here on the right who would like to ask a question. Yeah, let me ask a, a question related to actually a presentation last year at SID, but uh, this is Tony Pryor, by the way, with IRG. But also, first of all, I, I was just in Uganda last week, and one of the discussions up in northern Uganda is, you know, is there something about our relationships pre-conflict that allows us to work better post-conflict? I mean, there's a, some, in other words, do we just come in after something's happened, or what are the, what are the relationships before that can make all this better? But Last year, Ambassador Glilizad raised a really interesting point. He said one of the issues from his point of view for Afghanistan was that in a way both the military and aid have it wrong in a way. And that the issue is not let's wait until we can find the, the way to have a good society in place, a good governance structure in place in terms of aid, or let's just get peace on the ground. He said in a way it, what matters is getting the peace on the ground that people feel is legitimate. It's legitimate legitimacy of the entity that's actually more important in a way than what it is. You can have the Army Corps of Engineers clean the streets, but in a way, I think what he said was, it's more important to a citizen of Kabul that somebody in Kabul help clean the streets. So if you could talk a little bit about that too. Thank you. Thank you. Paddle? Amen, absolutely. I, I, I would agree. Colleagues? Yeah, I don't think, I mean, I, you're part of your you're hitting at the issue of appropriate, appropriate assistance. I think, as he said, amen. I, I, but I think, you know, and, and uh, with kudos to our military colleagues uh, and how far the military has come in the 10 years that I've been involved in this, there's now a recognition at the level of captain. I mean, you know, young military officers understand it ain't just a matter of paving streets. It's a matter of building credibility for the host nation government and their ability to take care of their people. So they went from sewage, water, electricity, and trash as kind of the key indicators to, in Iraq, the Iraqi ability to address those things. So I, I think increasingly we've got it. Don't be complacent. We probably don't completely have it, but we're getting there. Tony, you know where I stand on this. I, I, I agree completely. I think Larry's captured it. Very nicely. I mean, as I said in my comments, legitimacy is critical. The question is, how does the legitimacy accrue to that government with support from the various donors? But it's, it's got to be seen as 
them and not, and not us. And our role has to be carefully balanced so that we don't project ourselves too out, too far out in front. I mean, we, we, we've talked about, whether it's in Afghanistan or Pakistan or elsewhere, about wanting the benefits of the project to be accruing to the local officials. When we, the donor community, are so visible, and which we need to be in some cases, um, it, it's hard for people to really think that's coming on behalf of the government. So again, it's, it's, it's that balance. We're going to be out there, we the partners, helping the locals put in place the program. The question of who gets the legitimacy on that project, well, that's something that the government is going to have to work on. It's, 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 it's their communication strategy at the end that's going to help, not ours. You know, I'll make your question harder and a bit more aggressive. What you could have asked us was, how does USAID's branding strategy, insisting that we stamp from the American people on every school, lunchbox, and book bag we deliver, actually increase the legitimacy of the host nation government? And the answer is, we're not there yet. I mean, I, there are issues with branding. It, it, and, I, and I do wear an aid hat, and I will probably hear about this later in the day. Um, <laughs> But, you know, there are U.S. tax dollars that we're using for this, and so there are certainly, absolutely without question, cases where this should be branded as from the American people. But I think we've been a little overzealous in that regard, and I'm looking forward to ongoing discussions about how we fine-tune that. Thank you. Um, we have about ten minutes left. I see there's a gentleman who's yep. got the mic in his hand. If there are other individuals who would like to ask a question, and I see a lady in the back here. Why don't we take uh, these last three questions so that we can allow time for the panel to respond and have any closing remarks. I see a fourth question there. We've got, let's, let's run through them quickly and keep your questions succinct. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Adam Safran I'm with Management Systems International. And to build on, on your just the last point, um, throughout the day, the, the primary, primary themes we've been hearing are alignment and division of labor, partnerships, collaborations, leading to aid effectiveness and ownership. And so I'd like to ask a, a tactical question. We don't often get to be in a room with, with aid, state, and defense at the same time. And the question is really ownership on our, on, of us and how the coordination is going to take place between the, the three institutions. Um, most of the coordination would take place more so in a post-conflict environment. But where, where DOD hands off to aid is unclear. Uh, state's role in the, in the divisions between the three Ds. And maybe it's not a fair question for you, Jim. You just got there, or a fair question, period. But it would be nice for us to know tactically how you see in a post-conflict situation the continuum of development in the roles of each of your organizations. Thank you. There's, let's take another two or three questions so we can just go through these and then the panel will have plenty to chew on. Hi, my name is Jessica Cravan. I'm from Creative Associates and actually my question is a little bit of a follow-on of his and what I was wondering was basically in an SNR situation where you see local capacity pretty low and security deteriorating, how um, how do the three organizations and the implementers there on the ground, how do, how do we modify and who takes the lead? And if you could talk about that. And also, I just wanted to say thank you for your very thoughtful comments. And I love the uh, notion of conflict entrepreneurs. Thank you. There's a lady in the back who's been very patient, uh, wearing a white shirt. And then be before that, I have a promise next. I'm sorry? Go ahead and ask your question, and then there's another person who okay. had her hand up for quite some yes. time. I'm Leo Serla with Metametrics, and I have a fairly succinct question. Um, over the past eight years, the USAID budget has increased from $10 billion to $20 billion a year. And of course, approximately half of that increase is for current conflict countries, Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and of course, we have uh, 10 billion a year now from PEPFAR, and about two thirds of a billion a year now for uh, the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Question is, what what are the resources out of Department of Defense that are dedicated to these quasi-developmental activities? What is that number? Thank you. Next question, please. Is that me? Yes. 
I am Lucy Phillips with IBI International. And I'm kind of surprised that you haven't mentioned Liberia much in this discussion. Uh, we've been working with the G Governance and Economic Management Assistance Program in Liberia. And I think it, it offers some examples of where aid has gotten the timing right and had the advantage of working with good local elected, locally elected uh, leadership. And as I see it, the, the timing in the, in the transition, under the transition government, three or four year stabilization, initial stabilization period, there was largely donor assisted uh, stabilization and reconstruction going hand in hand. But once the newly elected government took over, the stabilization has remained in UN hands uh, while local uh, security forces are being trained. But the uh, reconstruction, the capacity building within the institutions has been able to move fairly rapidly in part because it was requested by the donors with the, by the government with the donors. And I wondered whether, uh, the, whether that model is, is being considered in other countries. Uh, obviously you can't guarantee the election of strong and uh, sound local government, but uh, the multilateral, the fact that the, the U.S., w was the U.S. Um, non-direct military involvement but the U.S., the military involvement there is multilateral. It's U.N. peacekeeping forces. Yes. Was that a, a deliberate choice on the part of the Department of Defense? Thank you for your question. We have just very few minutes left. Um, I'm sorry I'm not going to be able to get to that last question, but the panelists will be here and you can come up after the panel. I'd like to let uh, our panelists respond to these very excellent four questions before our time is up. Thank you in whichever order. We'll just go down. Okay. I'll, I'll quickly go through uh, the ones that are relevant to aid. Uh, you know, um, we, we don't often speak about the successes. <laughs> we tend to dwell on the countries that are less than successful, which is why we've been spending perhaps more time on Afghanistan today than on Liberia, which is, I think, is a successful model. L Larry and I also both worked in Afghanistan. I do not know Liberia, but that's my problem. I would note that whether it's Liberia, Rwanda, Uganda, Mozambique, uh, countries in Latin America like um, um, uh, Salvador and, and to some extent Guatemala, there are a whole host of countries that have evolved out of some form of conflict that I would say today are considered successful models of post-conflict setting. I would caution us, however, um, Paul Colley and others have noted that it usually takes about a good 15 years uh, three elections before you really know whether a country has successfully done that transition uh, and Liberia is still not out of the woods yet but it is a successful model and I apologize for not uh, focusing more on the successful models. Um, on um, coordination, I'm actually going to defer to Larry on that, but I would say one of the things that aid is going to be doing uh, uh, is uh, spending more time on the ground working with our State Department of Agriculture and other colleagues who may be present on the country team working on coordinated planning through the uh, country um, uh, through the country plans. Uh, this is something that SCRS has been pushing many of us to do. I'll, I'll let Larry talk about the details, but aid um, has now uh, fully embraced this notion and is going to be spending a lot more time coordinating its, its own development planning on the ground. One of the things that we're also going to be doing now as part of a of a of our new business plan that we hope the new administration will also embrace is something that we used to do very well and that is uh, we used to put a technical advisors into uh, our ministries, into the ministries in, in countries with which we were working, whether it was somebody working in the health ministry to help build capacity or in the central bank or whatever. Obviously, in the, in the past 15, 20 years, we've relied heavily on you, our partners, to serve as those primary counterparts. While we'll still need you as our partners, increasingly, I think our new business model encourages aid officers with the right technical skills to also be out there with our technical, assist, with our technical assistance, our support, our mentoring, and working with our counterparts. Thank you. Yeah. The, um with respect to Liberia, I, I pair it with uh, Elizabeth said, I think it is a model of success 
with, with caution and caveats. I was actually in Liberia in 1979. So you can maybe understand my trepidation about jinxing it by talking too soon about successful transitions. But I think the, the things that you pointed out are elements of a successful way forward with respect to division of labor um, among the multilateral partners. I'm more interested in the, and obviously professionally directly interested in the question about coordination. Um, and I think I heard you say, or as part of your question, you described, is this a continuum of development? And I'm a visual person. To my mind, it's more a choreography of development. There is no longer, in my, in my mind, a model of defense passing the baton in a particular engagement. It's no longer the, the, the six phases. I go nuts when military officers present the slide that shows the six phases of a conflict. It, it's, it, they're, they're simultaneous and sequential, if that's possible to understand. A, an academic footnote, if you Google the expression wicked problems, um, it'll, it'll, it'll turn you in the direction that a lot of us are now moving in terms of how we conceptualize and talk about these post-conflict states. Um, but it, instead of a continuum, imag imagine a very evocative or a very elaborate dance with different actors performing at front center stage at different times. And the choreography changes every time we engage. That increases the burden on our young professional officers in the military. It increases the burden on the professional officers at USAID as stewards of good development. And it increases the importance of what Elizabeth mentioned briefly, which is planning. In the past, the military has dominated our planning for engagements because they have planners and the civilian agencies, for the most part, don't. Or the planners that we do have do other kinds of planning. We are in the process of rectifying that. It's not going to happen in a year. It's probably going to happen in three or four or five years. But we're building civilian capacity to do that. So in the immediate term, to answer your question directly, uh, we have a do no harm strategy. We don't want to mess with the young captains and the young FS3s who are doing good coordination on the ground. But we do want to build coordination at the operational and the strategic levels, which we're doing. There's an exercise literally today in Europe, uh, a steer challenge 09, where we're doing some of that exercising. In the midterm, there are some modest reforms that I think the administration will begin to exercise as soon as we have our political appointees in place. And then long term, there's a lot of interest in things like a quadrennial development review, the uh, project for national security reform that Jim Locker is chairing, um, and then the, the new initiatives to, to reconsider the Foreign Assistance Act and, and find ways to streamline and make that more effective and dynamic. Thank you, Larry. And I think, uh, Jim, you have the last word here because we're running out of time. Larry's so. covered the ground exceptionally well. Uh, I would say somewhere between Larry's notion of choreography and Anne-Marie Slaughter's concept of the inherently fuzzy boundaries, and I think we've captured the essence of the problem. It, you're right. It's not actually the handoff. It is the foreknowledge mm -hmm. before, during, and after the handoff of what the other side needs and how they will actually respond or act once um, initiatives are conveyed. Uh, and that we, we have to be inherently civilian and military at all stages. Yeah. Does the Defense Department want to uh, uh, run the civilian side? No, we don't want to run it any more than President Obama wants to run Chrysler. Um, we want to be part of it. We, we want to be ready, as we must be, to be there if no one else is able to deliver. The problem that poses is, of course, other people look at that and say, aha, you're, you're worming your way into the, the mission. And, and it's a challenge, and, and I won't deny that. And we will take continuous efforts and oversight to, to work hard on, on establishing good common perceptions um, of how this all uh, works together. A colleague here asked about DOD spending on um, development, quasi-development assistance, actually our DOD comptroller is looking at that issue. Um, it's because uh, there are many different resources which arguably have that capacity building effect. We know the most obvious ones, the most celebrated, well-publicized ones, uh, um, Section 1206 authorities under NDAA and so forth. But uh, it, it's, a, it's an issue which I hope we can provide more uh, uh, clarity on. And, in the near future. Um, with respect to your question, Johanna, on QDR, uh, Anne-Marie, actually, I gave, I thought, over lunch a very helpful response. We are trying to draw in uh, and understand exactly uh, where civilian agencies uh, stand on, on these fuzzy boundaries. Uh, 
for our own knowledge and awareness. I personally would like very much to see the, a quadrennial effort across the entire executive branch. Uh, there are congressional mandates to be considered and different agencies have different response uh, needs to Congress, as do we, but maybe in the longer term we can work together on, on uh, refining the product. Thank you. Well, I think we should thank all our panelists for doing such an excellent job in a very limited time. And, and maybe we can wish for a whole of government approach by next year's conference. Um, I'm also to just make a little housekeeping announcement for all of you. There's going to be a 15 minute break uh, because this room is going to be set up for author Michael Fairbanks who is on the next session. So uh, again, thank you all to our uh, excellent speakers and thank you for Sid for having me and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. <laughs>